All right, it's great to be here again today. I have got another author from our new book coming out, International Education uh, Leadership Stories from Around the Globe. I'm so excited to have you here with us today, Ruth. I enjoyed reading your chapter and just having a chance now to share even a little bit more context of your background and experience in international education, some of these stories around getting down to business. I loved your chapter because I think this is one of those pieces of the puzzle that's one of those divides between moving from a teacher into a principal and then even on into a director or superintendent position like yours. Are those experiences you just may not be able to have in leading the financial aspects or of the business side of a school. So super excited to share this, but also to hear a little bit just more about what it's like to be in international education. You have so much rich background in that. So welcome today. And we'll just start off, if you would just give our audience a little bit of background about your career, where you live, what's the school where you work, and share them with them a little bit about who you are. Oh, it's great. Thank you very much, Lindsay, and thanks for the invitation. It's great to be able to share this and to speak to you again. So yeah, I'm, I started my career as an educator, um, as a high school English teacher, English language and literature teacher in the UK. So, you know, I'd worked there for about 10 years, and people often ask me, you know, why did you make the move to go over to Colombia? And it's very difficult to pinpoint any particular reason other than February in the UK is not a great place to be necessarily. Um, and so it was one of those rainy cold afternoons that I saw an advert, an advert in the paper for a school in Bogota, Colombia, decided to apply um, and came over here. And I was never really intending to stay more than for about two years. And I'm here 23 years later um, and loving every minute of it still. Um, so, so I came over as an English teacher as well. And I was teaching high school English in the IB program in a school in Bogota. And I always intended to go to other international, you know, other South American countries but I kind of got stuck in, in Colombia. I married my husband here, he's Colombian. Um, so I've moved around different schools within the country and had lots of different experiences in different types of schools in the country. Um, I've been in Cartagena, in La Guajira, um, which is kind of the wild west of Colombia. Well, it's the wild east, if you like. It's right on the, the north, northeasternmost tip of South America. And I'm currently in Medellin in the Columbus School in Medellin, which is it's a big school. It's over 1,800 students now, um, you know, so very exciting place to be, lots going on, and still really enjoying being here. And I've had the pleasure of getting to meet you in Medellin, and that was just such a treat. That is a beautiful city, and I know the Columbus School has such a tremendous reputation in international education, I think. I would say I attribute a large part of that to the work that you've done there. So we're so just grateful to have you here and sharing some of the depth of those experiences um, today with our audience. This chapter that you shared with our community around uh, getting down to business, kind of managerial, the financial aspects of education, particularly in international schools, there's so many rich details in there. But if you had to distill it down to a couple of key points that you'd say, you know, I really wanted to hit home with this. These are things that if I had only known when I was aspiring to be a director, for instance, or a superintendent, these are some key pieces. What would you say those some of those key points are? Well, I think in my experience, I never really envisaged myself becoming involved in finance. I was an educator always. I was, you know, a teacher first and foremost. And then moving into the position of school director, um, suddenly kind of almost from very little experience beyond managing a departmental budget or something like that, I was suddenly faced with this idea of, okay, now I need to know about finance from a much more formal perspective and a, a much wider perspective. And, and I think one of the things that I mentioned in the chapter was that um, to begin with, I, I tended to delegate the responsibility of those financial positions to the people who I thought, well, these are the experts. I don't really know about this, so I'll delegate that. But um, the key point for me is that as, as a school director, you soon learn that every decision you take about academics has an impact on the administration and the finance of the school. 
And it's the same the other way around. Any decision you take about finance or administration has an impact on the academics of the school. And so as a it's an, you know, as a school director, if you are wanting to truly move the strategy of the school forward, you cannot delegate all of that financial administrative decision making to somebody else who is not an educator and who doesn't have that other perspective. Um, and so, you know, that being the main point then, that leads into the notion that the relationship between the school director and there's various figures here depending on the type of school you have, but the school business manager or whoever is leading the business office of the school you know, that, that having a successful um, working relationship with that person is absolutely key. Um, you have to have that. Um, and of course, that, like any relationship, you can develop that through um, building up personal trust with the person. And there's all kinds of strategies, obviously, that you can do there, like you would with anybody else in school. But the chapter, what I was trying to do in the chapter was talk about how you can all, if you create an institutional structure of trust, then that facilitates the relationship between you and the key people in the, in the business office. And, and I think there's, there's kind of three elements to that. One, two of them, I think we all think about most of the time, which is, you know, having clear rules and regulations about how thing work, things work and systems. And then there's a the notion of having shared values and clear standards about how things should be managed. But the third one is ensuring that you have um, a shared cognitive understanding of the assumptions that we all might have behind the decisions we take. So, you know, one that's really important is do we both understand what we mean by efficiency? Um, so a business manager might look at the schedule and might say, you know, this teacher only has a certain number of hours. That's not efficient. And then you, but you as a school director may know that that, you know, that there's other things that are expected from that person that take more time that don't necessarily appear on a schedule. And so it's those kind of areas sometimes that we tend to skip over that are really important to define. And you're touching on some key points that I found very illuminating myself. And again, just in that mindset of someone approaching the position, not knowing what they don't know, there's so much value in the pillars that you describe and understanding the way that this business manager may be approaching things that mm -hmm. you need to learn about the way they're thinking just as much as illuminate for them what it is that you, they need to know from you too, so that you're jointly making those decisions for the future of the school. I think you did a really great job hanging it all under that, essentially the school's mission and vision too, right? That is really, truly yeah, that, you are a united front. Yeah, the, the mission and the vision underpin everything. Yep. And, and you know, the obviously being able to have a clear understanding with the business office of, of what that vision and purpose might be and how it might impact on the decision there is, is vital, absolutely vital. I have to say I had a little chuckle too with the, the manager who decided to remove some of the playground equipment due to a risk analysis <laughs> and the small children's grumpy faces. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <Come> on. <laughs> exactly. I think it's, you know, when you're in the academic side of a school, you are very, you're very, um, you have very clear that it's a human organization yeah. and it's unpredictable and you can't necessarily um, say how those small children, you know, you, you can't take away all the risks. Right. You know, that's one of Never. the things that, that children need to learn through risks. And yes, they're going to fall off the swing, but that's yeah. what they need to do. Exactly. Yeah. So we're going to shift gears to maybe even a little bit of a bigger picture here. You have been in international education for several decades, as you said. You know a lot of people in the field also. In the context of just education itself, what makes international education unique? I, I do feel that on the one hand, every single international school that I have either worked in or visited is unique in itself. And that to a certain extent is what makes international education unique. So you have schools that are international because they have an international student population and you talk about 40 different nationalities and, in, you know, and English is the only common language. Or then you have schools like ours 
where 95% of the students are local Colombian students, and yet we have an international teaching um, community and we have an international, um, or you might have an international curriculum like the International Diploma. In our case, we have a US curriculum with advanced placement and things like that. So I think every single school is unique in itself. But what I found the, um, the most appealing about international education is that the, the sense of autonomy that we have. You know, we're not, we do have some local national requirements that we have to fulfill, but they're relatively, um, you know, it's a, it's a relatively easy framework to work within. And beyond that, we can create courses, we can, we can, you know, um, I think we're implementing design courses, we're implementing courses in robotics, we're implementing, and we don't need to go to um, a state official or to a national to get approval for those. We can experiment, we can learn, we can make mistakes with the students and grow from that. So I think that autonomy and creativity is what really makes international education, um, from the teacher's perspective, a really attractive option. Yep, I can second that from personal experience, and well, and now having returned to the United States from being international too, seeing that again, that just that difference there. I think international schools in many cases are leading the way. I mean, they are able to be more progressive, as you said, more creative, try things, push the boundaries, etc. And so, I would hope that exactly. perhaps more national education systems might be able to take some lessons from that someday, perhaps. Yeah, I also like the fact that because we draw in teachers from all over the world and, and you know, what I'm seeing is that there's a tendency to widen out. You know, obviously most of our teachers come from the US, Canada, um, but we are, each year, we're increasing the variety of international backgrounds that we have in school. Right. And so you can create kind of hybrid programs from all of that. You can draw the best parts of other programs and, you know, put them all together and create something magical. Yeah. Globalize it. Yep. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. So we asked you to write this chapter and we said, okay, now squeeze it all into just a couple thousand <laughs> words. And we know there's so much more. I've already said to you that I think you should turn this into a book. <laughs> what, would there be another aspect that you really said, oh, I would have loved to have covered on this or touched on that? Um, within this particular concept of the book or of the chapter, if you will? Well, there was, as I was writing this, um, and you know, one of the things that came into mind was the notion of how we might move forward with this, some of these things. And one aspect that I think is really challenging for our schools right now, but is something that really needs further uh, um, exploration, is that notion of. Um, you know, we are all talking about um, diversity, about equity, and yet the great majority of our schools do have these systems where we have um, a set of salary benefit structure for the expat teachers that we hire overseas that come in, and then we have a different set of salary structure benefits for the local teachers. And... I do believe that we need to do a lot of exploration in that area to see, you know, how is that working? Is that is that justifiable? Is that something that can be sustainable in the long run? And um, what does it mean to be an expat? Um, do do I need to, you know, what what am I sacrificing in a way to be an expat, and what am I gaining to be an expat? And I think all of those areas about how we are managing that aspect of things, particularly in the human resources side, is, is really interesting and really important to look into. Um, and what's particularly interesting for me is that I'm also seeing that our schools are a, a gateway for the local teachers to actually become international. So we're seeing an increasing number of local teachers who've, um, in, my, in our case, you know, they've been trained in Colombia, they've gone to a bilingual school themselves in Colombia, so they're highly bilingual. And our school becomes a gateway for them to go and get their own international experience. So we've had teachers who've left us who are now working in Spain, in Dubai, in Qatar, and in, in all over the world. 
and they're actually gaining their own expat experience over there. And I, and I think all of that area of what makes an expat teacher, what does it mean to be an expat teacher? What do I bring? What do I give? That, that from the perspective of administrating the school, I think is really an area that really needs further exploration. So I know from knowing you that you're very connected in the international community. Do you feel as if there are others out there that are opening their eyes and considering exploring that? Because I think that's a really, very, just a very current and relevant topic, I think, that you've touched I on. I do. I do know that some there has been some um, research on those, you know, the very specific area of remuneration between yeah. these different groups. And I know that but I do think it needs to be updated. The, the research that I've seen um, was potentially from maybe about, you know, the, the one that I've seen anyway, maybe 10 yeah. to 15 years ago. So now I think with the, the context of the world and the expectations are changing. And um, yeah, I do think that's something, I've read some, I've read some information, you know, some articles about it, um, about how these, how these issues impact upon relationships in the staff room, for example, that was yeah. an I saw recently. Um, and so, yeah, I, de I definitely think it's right for truly looking into and, and getting to grips with it. It's something that I'm sure is impacting on all international yeah. schools. I could imagine as well. Yeah, and I think I'm so glad you brought that forward. And I think that is a topic that if we are gonna truly say that we are providing a global education, we need to reflect that in our practices too. So I think that's that's something very interesting to see moving forward if schools investigate and explore that. Okay, so a little more on the personal side now. You've had some, I'm sure, exciting adventures and stories and experiences and such. You know, if you're speaking with those who may not be as familiar with international education, what would be something that you would share with them about your your life experiences in this career? I think I was, I, you know, some of the experiences I've had, I would say, uh, similar to an experience that somebody could have when they go on holiday, you know, we all, you know, any kind of international travel. But I think the difference of um, living and working in another culture, in another place, um, you know, as, a, as an educator, what I'd like, what I would like to highlight is the fact that you don't just learn about another culture, you learn with another culture. And I think some of the, the most significant experiences that I've had as an educator living overseas is precisely when I've had that opportunity to actually learn alongside other people who come from a very, very different background, who are working, living and working even in a very, very different context. Um, now I had a very, I had a very special experience when I worked in La Guajira, which, as I mentioned, is is a very remote part of Colombia, and it's a part of Colombia where there is the 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 largest indigenous population, the the Waidu, who live in La Guajira, and being there, I actually had uh, the opportunity to take part in a leadership diploma working with school directors from some of the indigenous schools in the local area. And that was absolutely incredible. So, um, you know, working alongside them and then going to visit their schools. So, for example, one of them was a director of a boarding school. Now, when you say boarding school to me, I think of Harry Potter and Hogwarts, you know? Exactly. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, but this was, you know, we went out to visit the school and... It, you know, and I'm looking around the school for, okay, so these are the classrooms, but where's the sort of boarding area? And then you realize that they basically push all the tables to the side at the end of the day and hang hammocks up in the same classrooms. Wow. The classrooms become their, that's where they sleep because yeah. they, you know, they are, that's how they sleep. They don't sleep, you know, they sleep in, in the hammocks. Um, yeah. And seeing that and also seeing an incredible science lesson, which I would say maybe did have more to do with Hogwarts than you would think. <laughs> it was where the the knowledge of the teachers about the um, about the characteristics of the of the local plants and how you could use them and what you could mix and what 
what they could be used for and why these ones grew in this particular area and these ones didn't grow in this other area. And these are all amazing plants and herbs that you've never seen before in another part of the world. And so, you know, I, I think for me as an educator, those are the experiences that I don't, you know, obviously I wouldn't have had if I'd yeah. stayed at home. So. Right. Oh, that sounds amazing. And just, you know, education is life, right? Not just preparation for life is the quote, right? of that, exactly. that complete experience of all of the different ways that that it's being done and then that, that you bring back to your own community and to your own school. Exactly. I love it. it. It makes me miss it very much. So thank you for bringing <laughs> that forward. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to perhaps, if you will, give away a secret. You've done some travel, I imagine. And we know Colombia is an incredibly beautiful place in and of itself. So that might be the source of your answer, might not. But is there a place that you would say, if there's one spot I could go back to that is that, that special place, what would it be? How would you describe okay. it? It's a difficult one. And I'm going to cheat a little on my answer. No worries. <laughs> I, you know, I would like to always be able to go back in any spot to that, that honeymoon period that moment in time when you are setting out somewhere new, where it's all new, it's all magical, it's all different. Um, you, are, you are learning things every moment and seeing things for the first time that you've, you know, or from a perspective that you've never, you've never seen them before. And I've had so many moments like that. I mean, in, in Colombia, I don't know if, um, if you've been able to see lately the, the new Disney movie, no. Canto, which was about... Oh, Columbia. I've heard about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you must see that. And, okay. you know, one of the things, for example, about Colombia is obviously it's the birthplace with Garcia Marquez of magical realism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, magical realism isn't actually imaginary. There are places here where I've been where, where you, you see clouds of butterflies appearing just after a night of rain and everywhere's covered in yellow butterflies. And I thought reading 100 Years of Solitude, that was completely yeah. imaginary. It's not, wow. it's real. And then if you see the film, if you see the film in Canto, you see these scenes of, of flowers just bursting out all over the place and filling the landscape. And, you know, I can leave Medellin any given weekend and within, within an hour, I'm in that kind of landscape. Yeah. And it's, but it's, you know, to me, it's, it's being able to maintain, you know, one of the challenges is being able to maintain yourself, like in any relationship as well, <laughs> within that honeymoon period, make yeah. it, you know, because, because you do find, you know, obviously there's challenges and challenges can overcome you as well in, in, in any situation and in international education. But it's when you take that moment out to think, you know, Wow, you know, I've never—I would never see this kind of scenery. I would never have seen this. So this, you know, it's difficult to choose any particular one. But that's fair. I would say keeping them that mindset of the honeymoon period as frequently as you can. Make sure, make sure you're always in that one place. And Colombia is wonderful, and you would find many yeah. <laughs> all kinds of places like that. I love it, and endless opportunities for that too. But yes. I. I what you were saying completely made me have kind of shivers a little bit, just thinking about it too, because that's what travel can do. Right? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. In any, in any context and particularly with the opportunity to immerse yourself in a culture there and, and see it from fresh eyes and, and just, it's wonderful. So yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ruth. It's been great speaking with you. It's just good to see you again. And I'm so excited to be able to share this conversation and just elaborate the, the richness of the chapter that you shared with our community Looking forward to the world, seeing all of that and future learning opportunities through you and with you as well. So thank you for your time. And we look forward to seeing you again in the future. No, thank you very much for the opportunity, Lindsay. Thank you. Thanks for watching and learning with us at School Rubric with educators from across the globe. For more access to articles, magazines, podcasts, live episodes, our international school directory, courses, and more, visit us at schoolrubric.org. Thank you.